and welcome to the Governance Blueprint series. My name is John Landgrave and I'm a Power Platform Architect at Microsoft. In the last episode of this series, we looked at how you can secure the default environment in your tenant. In this episode, we'll look at tenant-wide settings that you can use to secure the Power Platform in your tenant. In Episode 1, I shared the common IT concerns regarding Power Platform security. Limiting users' ability to exfiltrate data was on the top of the list. In Episode 2, I showed you how to limit access to only Office connectors in the default environment and how DLP policies could be configured to allow different connectors in non-default environments. The other major data exfiltration concern comes from the use of email to move data outside your organization. We'll discuss how to manage this and more tenant-level security in this episode. Here's a list of the minimal settings you should configure to secure your tenant. In addition to setting Exchange Transport rules to limit email exfiltration, you can also set your tenant so that users don't have the option to share their applications with everyone in the tenant. We can limit gateway installers to ensure that users aren't moving data from your corporate systems into the Power Platform without your knowledge. We can also isolate your tenant from inbound or outbound requests and we configure DLP policies so that in addition to setting whether a connector is used or not, we can also limit to which endpoints a connector can connect and which actions it can per perform when it makes those connections. And finally, you can allow your users to have tenant-wide analytics to look at the assets that are in a specific environment. So let's get started. As many of you know, there is a user setting in Exchange that allows you to forward all of your email to an alternate email address. This is a significant security concern for most Exchange administrators, and so they have gone and blocked that setting at the server level. The problem is that when Power Platform sends an email, it's never a forward. It's always an original mail. Even if you pick up a mail from a mailbox and resend it with Power Automate, it looks like a new piece of mail and doesn't look like it's forwarded. So many customers were surprised to learn that even if they had set up the forwarding rules to keep people from taking their mail out of their inbox and sending it to a personal account, that doesn't apply to Power Platform. And an app could still send mail out and the rule forwarding wouldn't stop it. Again, this is because an email from Power Platform looks new, not forwarded. To correct this, the Exchange Administrator can create an Exchange Transport rule that processes the mail coming from Power Platform. The way this works is that Power Platform adds headers to the mail it sends, Exchange receives the mail, interrogates it, and applies the mail transport rules. For example, there's a header called XMS Mail Application that tells you whether Power Automate or Power Apps was the client who sent the mail. There's another header called Operation Type that says what this mail sent as, a forward, reply, or send. And mail transport rules can operate on that. So perhaps you'll let people reply mail from a Power App or Power Automate, but you won't let them send an original mail. You can also leverage mail flow rules to filter messages based on whether it's appropriate or not. You can exempt an individual app and allow it to send mail by setting its user agent. So say, for example, I'm going to block all mail coming out of the default environment. So I can go through and set up an Exchange Transport rule and say if the MS Mail application header value is either Power Automate or Power Apps and it's forward, reply, or send, then block the mail, which would block all mail coming out of the default environment. For example, at Microsoft, we don't allow anyone to send external mail from the default environment, and we give them a message saying that this has been blocked. But we do have specialized environments where we allow our employees to send mail as long as we are aware of the application they're using and the way that this mail is being forwarded. Another concern that's been expressed by several enterprise customers is that they don't want users creating applications to be able to share the application with everyone in the organization. To do this, you need to use PowerShell. The commands are shown here. What this will do is remove the share with everyone option in the Power Apps Canvas app client. Let's go back to the Power Platform Admin Center to look at some additional settings. You'll notice in the left navigation pane that if I pick data, this will show me all of the different data gateways that are installed in my environment. 
You'll also notice that if tenant administration is turned on, then I have the ability to manage who can install a gateway. By clicking on this and restricting users in the organization for installing gateways, I can identify the users in my organization who are allowed to create gateways. Administrators are always allowed to create gateways. This will ensure that gateways are only installed with the knowledge and consent of the governance team. In addition to configuring gateways, there are some other settings on policies which will help me secure my tenant. For example, tenant isolation allows me to specify which tenants are allowed to connect to me and to which tenants I am allowed to connect. This is important to control potential exfiltration from a malicious user. For example, I could go create an Office 365 trial environment and then from that trial environment log into my corporate environment and use a Power Automate flow to move data back and forth between those environments because by default I don't restrict to which tenants I can connect. But by limiting the inbound connections to only identified tenants and by restricting outbound connections to only identified tenants, I can remove the possibility that my tenant is being used to move data between this tenant and other tenants. As you can see, this in this specific case, I have allowed any outbound connections to take place, but I've limited inbound connections to a single tenant. You may consider starting your configuration by not allowing any in or outbound connections and then only adding them as users request them. In addition to isolating communication at the tenant level, we can also extend our DLP policies to allow specific connectors to only access specific endpoints or use specific actions. Let's look at our de developer environment policy. You'll notice if I go to my pre-built connectors and I look at my SQL Server connector, that in this ellipsis, I have two options for configuring my connector, one for endpoints and one for actions. So for example, if I pick connector endpoints, today this is allowing me to connect to any endpoint. But let's say, for example, you have developer environments and you want to restrict those developer environments to only accessing developer data. By adding an endpoint, like HTTPS colon whack whack, dev.contoso.com and then saving this I could allow anyone to talk to a dev environment but then deny every other connection. So this ensures that people working in a development environment are only accessing development data. In addition I can also specify what actions are allowed on a connector. So you'll notice currently I'm allowing all the actions on this connector. One of the common development patterns for SQL Server, however, is to only allow access to data through a stored procedure, and then allow these stored procedures to be consumed by applications written by corporate developers. Allowing end users to access tables directly would be in violation of this policy. So by going in and turning off any connection except a stored procedure connection, and then going in and blocking new connector actions, this will ensure that users consuming this connector are only accessing SQL data through a valid stored procedure that's been vetted by either a data steward or a developer. In episode two, we talked about how you would turn on tenant analytics settings. Once those are turned on, you can go to your analytics tab, pick Power Apps, And notice in the upper right, we have environment level analytics turned on. If I change this to tenant level analytics, now I can go see the Power Apps analytics for my tenant. Once you have turned this on, you can get several bits of information about your tenant. These include usage activity, where you can see who are using or making applications. You can also filter this by the type of application, the type of environment, the platform, the region, and other information. 
You can also see maker activity to see who is creating applications and how many of those applications have been published. And again, you can filter those using the filter. You can also do an application inventory. This is very useful for looking for applications that have been orphaned as you're able to view applications that haven't been used in over 180 days and then decide on how you want to clean up those applications. This is a limited view of the Power Apps and Power Automate flows that are in use in your tenant. Later on, we'll show you how to install the Center of Excellence Starter Kit to get a much more detailed view of what's happening in your tenant. In this episode, we showed you the minimal required settings to ensure that your tenant is secure. In the next episode, we'll show you how you can manage Dataverse for Teams.